don't have to answer this if you don't want to. I know uh, Jeff Meldrum was a bit reluctant, but um, Todd Standing. Oh. <laughs> Steve Calls, welcome. Thanks for joining. Oh, it's great to be here. Steve, you're basically, you're an expert in video analysis and photo analysis, and you've been investigating uh, Bigfoot since 1999, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I actually started getting into it in 98. Okay. And I was tiptoeing a little bit, and then 99, I went in full bore. And why Bigfoot? Well... As a kid, I had a fascination to a lot of different mysteries. Yeah. Um, and in 1988, I became actually a, a paid investigator. So I, I was doing professional investigations, investigating a lot of times, uh, you know, uh, organized retail theft, uh, check frauds, stuff yeah. like that. And, you know, fast forward doing that for 10 years and you start getting thinking about what you had kind of looked at as a small kid going, hmm, you know, I bet you this is a bunch of hooey. I bet, I bet you this is, you know, all re isn't real at all. Yeah. And a friend of mine uh, suggested I read this book called Monsters of the Northwoods. And it was about sightings that had occurred like literally miles, you know, from my house. So this is all within, you know, a couple hours of my house. Okay. And um, as it turned out, um, I started interviewing uh, with some of the police officers that, that had sightings uh, interviewing other people. And uh, I, I had been trained in forensic interviewing uh, in that 10 years, a uh, couple of different systems as well, very psychological uh, and how to approach it, looking at their neuro linguistics, uh, looking at their physical reactions. And these people, you know, were, sh being truthful they were they were telling the truth they had seen something that they believed was a bigfoot or a big hairy upright walking creature yeah so that's how it all started and what i like about uh this as to as to the other mysteries and, and mind you i i like paranormal investigations as well i don't mind ufo investigations but you know i looked at ufos and i god that's kind of going to be a boring boring job I mean, somebody calls you in and, oh, I saw this light in the sky. Okay, now what do I do? Yeah. <laughs> you know, whereas, you know, with, with this stuff, it, it's a boots on the ground. You get your hands dirty. You know, I, I know how to collect forensic evidence. I know how, you know, I, I know how to cast tracks. I know how to, yeah. you know, you analyze video, the, audio. Investigations. Right, yeah. 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 So, and uh, it, it really sharpened my skills in a lot of different other areas. Okay. And um, yeah, so you can basically, you pretty much trained to, uh, to, um, you know, spot bullshit. Yeah, <laughs> you know, in, exactly. In, yeah. 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 In, uh, in layman's terms. And, um, you know, what's the most compelling image or, you know, video footage that you've seen? Well, it, it has to be the Patterson Gimlin film is the most com compelling okay. video. Yeah. Um, you, you know, the, uh, I always say a, a video, picture, audio, you know, is not worth anything unless it has a good, decent story behind it. Yes. Um, you know, too many times we get these videos with no story, no, you know, what time of day was it, where it was and any of that. You just, oh, look, I got Bigfoot. And it's a 10 second video, 15 second video. There's nothing before it, nothing after it. Yeah. That's it. You look at the Patterson Gimlin film, there's a story behind it. There is video. Uh, film beforehand there's film afterwards there's tracks that were cast there was investigation done there was another researcher who found tracks in the same general direction days later of where patty was seen you know stomping off into the woods yeah. so you have that very compelling information and and a video that's re uh, really hard to say it's a suit off the shoot because how you know nobody's ever come up with a compelling suit uh, well, exactly. I mean, I had this conversation with uh, Dr. Jeff Meldrum as well, who was who I was lucky enough and fortunate enough to get on the podcast. And um, he he pretty much said it's kind of the muscle, the muscle structure, which it yeah. just fits perfectly. Um, you know, the anatomy is just too perfect to be to be a suit, especially during that time. Um, yeah, what, what got me was that calf muscle. You know, you see yeah. that calf muscle, the definition and I'm going. 
Well, the, the, a lot of people have come forward since then. I think uh, I'm not sure if I, if it's the uh, Phil Morris. I think is the guy's name. He came forward and said it was. Uh, I think it was him. I could be mistaken. It was his suit. Uh, yeah, Philip Morris. Name. Philip Morris came out and said, "Oh, that's my suit." But yeah. he didn't come out right away. It took him thirty years, thirty-five years to say, "Hey, it, you know, it's it's my suit." Yeah. And uh, the man who said uh, that he was the guy in the suit was Bob Hieronymus. Now, yes. uh, being an investigator, I look at the story and yeah. how they're telling it. And although he seems very convincing. Uh, they put him on the lie detector show years ago and it said, oh, he was telling the truth. But um, his story was inconsistent. When he first came out, he said he didn't show the suit to anybody but his mother and I think one of his other relatives that were at the house. Mm. About three or four months later, he made this comment, well, talk to anybody at this bar because I showed him everybody in the bar the suit. So that was a, a big change in direction. Everybody around here, you know, after a few years, that was me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We knew you. Uh, we, knew you. <laughs> we all just kind of, everybody yeah. just kind of kept it quiet. <laughs> Almost like saying, oh, you think I'm lying? Talk to all these guys. But yeah. nobody ever, nobody ever said that, you know, oh, I saw the, I, I was there today. Bob dropped the suit off. And showed everybody. Nobody ever came forward to say that. Uh, Philip Morris, I think, was just an opportunist. He had an opportunity to recreate the suit, and he couldn't do it effectively. Um, and they put it on Bob Hieronymus. And if you couldn't tell that was a suit, you know, yeah. And that's you know using the two thousands technology to manufacture a suit, not what was available in nineteen sixty seven. Yes. Yeah. Um, and basically there, there are a lot of, I mean, you must come, you obviously come across a lot of, um, hoax footage, uh, people that are, you know, claiming they've seen something for whatever reason with, you know, when they clearly didn't, why, why do people do this? Because I think I, I heard of it. There was a guy in Montana, if I'm not mistaken, I think he was, he was hit by a car dressed in a Bigfoot suit. And I think yeah, it was, it was either Michigan or Montana. He got hit twice. He got yeah. hit on one side of the road and got knocked over to the other side of the road and got hit again. Yeah. And all of that, that may be funny. He was killed. And, and there was these, two, it was like a teenage drivers that were driving the vehicles, two females, and they were traumatized by this. Yeah, guy, I, can, this well, I can imagine. So um, it's like, you know, um, it wasn't, it wasn't Aunt Shirley with the bullseye on the hood, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> trying to aim it, but um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I'm I'm laughing because I'm laughing at the, kind yeah. of the whole story. I'm I'm not obviously it's yeah it's yeah 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 the yeah. Guy died, yeah. But, I mean, it's just why would you do that? Um, it, it is kind of silly that to think mm. that. Now, there's I find there's uh, several reasons, and the first one is the Joker, and that's a person just looking to get a laugh for whatever reason. Yeah. Oh, it's funny, har har har, and they do it, and then you have the profiteer. And there are several of those in the Bigfoot community that they do it trying to capitalize on it money-wise. And they're the, the probably the least amount of people that do it, but the most amount of people that do it. And there's kind of a break off here. There's people who've had a legitimate sighting before, and then they end up getting this PTSD type of effect because the brain isn't, it's not in your system and all of a sudden there it is. And it gives you a trauma and whatever. And, then they start seeing Bigfoot everywhere. Oh, it's over there. It's over there. Every bump in the night's Bigfoot. Yeah. And then you have the final group, which is probably the most in number, is the people that go out every day and, oh, we got Bigfoot evidence. We're going to go out and do our research. Oh, we were surrounded by. And they're constantly saying this. Um, and that's because they have this, uh, they have something in their life. They want to elevate themselves in a community and they want to feel special and important. And it's because of some psychological need for some reason. Yeah. Um, so that that's generally the most you see as far as hoaxing. And it's not as obvious as per se the profiteer where you snag them or the jokester. Well, I think there's, there's um, you know, with uh, Bigfoot's pretty much become part of, of, of our culture today. Um, I mean, movies have been made, um, you know, stuff like that, but there's also a stigma attached where some people that could prohibit some people from actually, you know, who actually saw something um, that don't want to come forward because of the stigma of, uh, you know, it's another, yep. it's another crazy person that saw Bigfoot type thing. 
Yeah, and uh, luckily that stigma is slowly starting to fade a bit. Um, not as quite prevalent as it was back in the late 90s when I got involved in this. Yeah. Or even the 2000s. Uh, finding Bigfoot, although, um, and I always say this, there's a difference between documentaries and series that are documentaries because the series documentaries, you got to have those cliffhangers and that excitement to keep people coming back whereas a documentary you can just blast raw data at people and, and, yeah. and stuff of that nature but the one thing these shows did was it did not make bigfoot a four-letter word so a lot of people are feeling more comfortable now to say hey you know what i'm not the only person to have seen one uh so they're more willing sometimes now to give but that also creates a whole nother uh category of potential hoaxers the the people that want the attention. Oh yeah, come on. Yeah. I oh, I got all kinds of Bigfoot over here. And so yeah. it, it has its good and it has its bad. I think with I think with the stigma kind of uh starting to disappear, I mean you're kind of seeing the same thing with the whole UFO thing. Um, you yep. know, with the with the government that or the Pentagon sure. that's come out and saying that they, you know, they are unidentified flying objects and everything. It's kind of become more accepted now. And um it's I mean you know, one of the one of the um, the uh, cases that you came across was the Georgia body hoax. Oh and yeah, you actually you actually wrote a book about that called Fifty Lodge. Yep, absolutely. Um, yeah, can you tell us a bit about that? Well, prior to this uh, Bigfoot hoax, I had kind of infiltrated the Biscardi group. Uh, Tom Biscardi being the the promoter from San Francisco area to go out to Georgia and kind of promote this whole thing and got all this worldwide attention. And he's the guy who went on Fox news and said, you know, I felt it, smelled it, touched it. Um, now a lot of people didn't know is, is for the, you know, the six months prior, I really, I was out of that investigation. But when this happened, uh, one of the, the hoaxers, uh, Rick Dyer asked me on the podcast when I had the on cause I wanted to challenge him. And they made a lot of claims that we eventually proved were false. Mm. But uh, he mentioned, oh, do you know Tom Biscardi? Now, uh, he damn well knows I know who Tom Biscardi yeah. is. Yeah. And he did that as a such a way to get in touch with him. And uh, what, what happens is, is Biscardi and I have a conversation after that podcast. And he says, well, I'm going to find out if this guy's telling me the truth about the attorney. Can you see about this whole National Enquirer thing? And the next day, Scardi calls me. He said, well, I just talked to the attorney. He has no clue what Dyer's talking about. And I said, well, I just got a, a release from the from the National Enquirer press office saying they didn't offer him a million dollars for anything. You know, yeah. they, they don't have that kind of money floating around just to say, hey, I want to give you a million dollars. Because that was one of the claims he made on the podcast was that National Enquirer offered them a million dollars to sell the body. Okay. So he goes, well, I'm going to call him and give him a piece of my mind. And that was the last time I heard from Biscardi for about a day. And then I get a call back saying, oh, you know, I really think they've got it. And now he's playing this game. Okay. And um, in, in actuality, months after the hoax dissipated, I actually had a, a, a very decent conversation with Rick Dyer. And uh, he said, well, what he had said to me is, and it, knowing the lingo, being around Biscardi when I infiltrated, yeah, I, um, I, I knew how he talked. So when Dyer said this, it made all the sense. So in fact, everything that Dyer had told me was filling in those missing pieces of the puzzle. Okay. And um, I was like, ah, now, now I'm getting it. Now this makes sense what he was saying. And it makes sense what he was saying. Everything kind of now is fitting, um, which as an investigator, that's what I'm looking to do. And, yeah. but he said, yeah, he goes, Dyer, Dyer said, oh yeah. He called me and says, I know you ain't got what you got but there's a way we can all make money out of this. Okay. And I'm going, that sounds exactly like him. Mm. And uh, I said, so what was the end game? And he said, the end game was they were going to do a like, remember the alien autopsy video? Yes. Well, they were going to yep. do a Bigfoot autopsy video. Okay. And then that clicked with something Biscardi had told me saying, well, you know, next week he's telling me I got scientists coming out and all this. Yeah, but he never said who they were. But then he started bragging and getting braggadocious, which he is very much so. Okay. He said, oh, I got the, you know, the people who did the UFO documentary for Fox, you know, the alien autopsy, they're coming out here to film this. 
now when Dyer said that and it boom, it all made sense what the whole game was to make this Bigfoot, you know, autopsy video. Mm -hmm. Now, how was that going to end? Well, what it ended up happening was, is that of course I, and actually Tom's son were very suspicious of what was going on there. And I invited myself out to where the body went. So I went my own dime to get out there. Uh, and I, cause Biscardi did not want me there. And, uh, I get out there and, you know, Tommy, his son picks me up. And the next morning, or actually that night, we were listening to uh, Tommy and I, everybody had gone to sleep. We were listening to uh, Coast to Coast mm -hmm. with uh, George Norrie. And he had Lauren Coleman on. And he had this guy who said, yeah, that's in the pictures that were released. That's my suit. I know I created it. He goes, it's been altered a bit, but that's my suit. Jeez. So Tommy and I just look at each other like, so the next morning, and it was like 4.30 in the morning, I feel a tap on my shoulder. It was Tommy. He goes, come on, let's go see if this thing's real. Mm. So we go in there, and everybody else is asleep. We're chipping away, doing stuff, and we pull a hair out. Finally, well, he could say, he yanks out a hair. He goes, here, is it real? So I look at it under a magnifying glass, and I can see it's very hollow, very see-through. I go, it looks like plastic. Oh. By that time, another person had woken up, uh, Bob Smalls back, who was the SFBI vice president. And both at the same time, we said, well, how do we prove it's real? And then we both went, let's burn it because hair will burn. Plastic will melt. Melt. Yeah. So we lit it up and it just melted into a ball. Okay. So we knew it was plastic. So then he, Bob calls Tom and Bob is pressing. Listen, we need to vlog this thing out to see if it's real because none of the team was in on this. This was like, he was playing everybody for an idiot. Um, so we end up defrosting and a lot of the pictures. You'll see a hand reaching into that freezer, pulling up the foot. Yeah. That was my hand. Okay. That was actually my hand doing that. Um, so then, it, you know, a series of conversations were going on. And then Sunday morning, excuse me, Tom calls up and says, all right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to all sign non-disclosure agreements. And just say the boys, I'm going to say the boys got all well, the public pressure was too much and they took their body and left. Right. But he was still going to film that Bigfoot autopsy. You follow what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. And then he's got everybody under wraps. And I was like, and so he went around the room and a couple of the guys were away. The, the contract, the, the hired help was, was sent away. Mm. And of course, he had to include me. And guess who the lone descent, you know, everybody was like, well, you know, Tom, you are the boss, you know, and, and this was everybody saying this. Yeah. Guess who the lone dissenter was? You. <laughs> no, we're not going to cover a hoax up with a hoax. Yeah. And then that created a lot of stress between me and everybody else there, with the exception of the hired, hired help. We're good friends of mine anyway. So, yes. um, yeah, <laughs> we had a lot of sidebars with the hired help saying this is bad juju, him trying to cover this up and everything. It's um there's I mean there, there's so many cases of the paranormal where um you know people are just out to make money it's to sell a book or whatever sure. I mean this was yeah when you're talking about the end game with this thing you know filming the you know another alien autopsy the the alien autopsy I've actually um I've done a bit of research on that that was for the whole Roswell incident I think um mm -hmm. And I think the filmmaker, uh, the filmmaker is on IMDb or the the, the director sure. who did it. Um, and I think he's from London. He's from the UK, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I did a segment on this months back, but um, you know, you think so. What would the end game be? So the end game would basically be that um, you know, the closer the public got, the the more they play the pressure card, and then they just take the body and leave. Right, exactly. And the, and the the end game is this. We do this documentary, we make a million dollars out of it or two million dollars out of it or yeah. whatever we get for it. It's going to be phenomenal. And then we're going to leave it hanging on this mystery. Everybody's got non-disclosure, so nobody's going to talk about it. Yeah. We're going to make money. Who cares? Mm. And that goes back to the first thing. He says, I know this thing ain't real, but there's a way we can make money off of this. Yeah. Right. And uh yourself so you you started off as a skeptic with the whole um you know when going into the whole bigfoot thing and Skeptical. what are your thoughts yes yeah. yeah and what are your thoughts about it today well considering i've had 
two encounters, one in 2011 and one in 2012, I would say they, they're real. They're out there. Um, they exist. Um, I was leaning yeah. towards that probably uh, 93. I'd really gotten a, a convincing uh, story from a gentleman who had heard heard something, saw some shadows, yeah. found these tracks in the snow. And this guy was a former Vietnam Marine truck driver, had been living in the same house for 15 years. And he was scared out of his mind. Mm. And you could see, you know, goosebumps and the hair standing on his end while he's telling this story, reliving it, jugular vein distension, mm. shallow breathing because he's going through it again in his mind. Yeah. He saw something he believed that wasn't. So that began to make me tend to believe that something is not quite wrong, right here. Yeah. And the, the other thing is, is that he never looked for us. I heard this through a rumor of a family member of his. And they never really told me what road he lives. They even gave me, you know, it's something like this. Okay. And by looking at a map, knowing that they were, I looked and I go, that's got to be that. He got the name mixed up, but that's what it's got to be. So we drove up there and I was like, that's got to be the house. I pull in and sure enough, it was. Okay. Um, so the guy never expected us, but he was very happy that somebody didn't think he was a crackpot. Yeah. And that's what we look for in in, in legitimate witnesses. They're, in witnesses. They're not looking for fame, fortune, anything like that. They're looking for validation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, it's it's uh, again, it's a little bit of that stigma that's still that's still pre prevalent today. Um, yeah. You know, you're not just going to come out and say, "I saw Bigfoot." The other thing is, there's so many sites on social media. There's so many Bigfoot groups on Facebook, uh, you know, Reddit or whatever. A lot of people are posting or posting, uh, you know, pictures and videos daily of, you know, if we have proof and, you know, this is beyond a shadow of a doubt. And, you know, so it's, it's and that's what they are. They're shadows and well, circles. Yeah. And, and, and the thing is with today, I mean, Photoshop and stuff today, um, I mean, sure. people can make such a convincing, how do you basically filter that out without actually speaking to someone? Um, you know, Photoshop, uh, videos, photos, whatever. Well, there's only so much you can do, but how, how do yeah. I filter that out is very simple. What's the story behind it? Well, if there is no story, does that make it yeah. pretty much? Pretty much, you know, if there's no story behind it, there's nothing. In, in the world of science for, and even in the world of, you know, law. Yes. You just can't say, oh, here you go. This is evidence. And then, well, the court just doesn't accept this evidence. Where's the where, where's the, uh, you know, the property log? Where is yeah. the, you know, where did you collect this? How did you collect this? Who collected yeah. it? You yeah. know, there, there's none, if that, none of that information exists, it's not evidence in a court. Yeah, I mean, uh, logically yeah. speaking, if, if I was to take a photo of what I thought was Bigfoot and, you know, the photo came out pretty good, yep. I'm going to have no shame in actually giving it to, you know, someone like you or whoever else uh, and sure. saying, well, what do you think? Um, yeah. Okay. And here's the other thing. If they're reluctant to send you an original picture via email, then chances are it's garbage because what they do is Facebook, you know, kind of processes that image before they put it up on Facebook. Okay. So when you pull up a picture off of Facebook, it's already been renumbered. All the metadata is gone. And you can't really get anything out of it. Even you can't even do an error level analysis test, which means if you can see if the picture is layered. Okay. If they're willing to send you that picture, then you're going to look at the properties of that photo. It's going to give you the metadata. It's going to give you the time, the date, um, yeah. in some cases, the location, but not always. Mm. It's going to give you what type of camera was used. Um, you know, the f-stop speed, your ISO speed, your aperture opening, it's going to give you all that information. Okay. And that is essential because there are certain settings for wildlife and there are certain settings for indoors, you know, indoor type of shoots. Um, all right. okay. and then, but the main important thing is the time and the date, are they consistent with the story are they in fact the very first one i busted wide open was the uh sonoma video which was also known as the penn and teller hoax and this guy came out with a video and he posted a bunch of pictures created this website and i forget his name was mark something or other but anyway he he created all of this whole story well the pictures were not consistent with the story 
Okay. You know, why would you take a picture of the dog and not your boot? Why would you wait a day to take your boots and send it away? Yeah. And then the boots were taken the day after the dog. You know, you're going to, you know, you're going to take a picture of the dog who was all, you know, made no sense. Mm. So that metadata kind of killed this timeline. And of course I called it and, and I actually called the motive. It's made to make, you know, somebody in the Bigfoot field look like an idiot. And that's exactly what Penn and Teller were trying to do. Okay. Um, and, um, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, I know, sure. if, uh, Jeff Meldrum was a bit reluctant, but, um, Todd standing. Oh. <laughs> so there was a, a huge mistake Todd standing and made as he gave the picture of one of his heads, the one that eventually a couple of years later, he turned into this blinking Bigfoot. Mm. Well, he put a picture of it and he sent the picture to the Calgary, the Edmonton Sun. Mm. So I went to their website and I said, well, I'm going to save the picture. And I right clicked on it and it was the original file. Oh, okay. So I got all the metadata. <laughs> and all the metadata is telling me uh, the ISO speed, the, sh the sh you know, which the, which is the, sh you know, shutter speed, the aperture, mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the um, uh, f-stop, the focus was all set. And I've talked to three photography professionals and they were all set for an indoor picture. They weren't set for like a motion picture. Okay. Right? You know, and obviously think about that. How, why would you set your focus in so close yeah. yeah when you're trying to shoot a wild animal the best way to do it is shoot it from afar so it doesn't get blurry and you're yeah. not shaking the camera mm. right so that's you know that, that way i mean i knew the type of camera the date the time it was taken um it was before geotagging was done on you know, a lot of these devices now which are usually more to the camera phones that are mm. you know they, they you can geotag them but yeah, it was very clear that this was all. And then I ran the ever level analysis test. And guess what that showed? It showed that some layers of the stuff in front of the face were put there after the fact. So it was a layered picture. Well, um, he, he ended up suing the British Columbian government, I believe. Well, here's the mistake about a lot of people think, well, Todd's, Todd's a good guy. He's trying to save. Well, no, uh, he wasn't looking for protection for the animal. He wasn't looking for Canada to recognize it as an animal. Yes. What it was, was a play by saying, you got to say Bigfoot's real because that violates my civil rights. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. Which is ridiculous. Yeah. It means if I believe Winnie the Pooh is real, you know, and the government's violating my rights trying to tell me he's a fictional character. Yeah. Yeah, well, the same, thing, the same thing can pretty much be done with uh, the Loch Ness monster, um, yeah. UFOs, what you know, uh, sure. ghosts, uh, sure. anything. Yeah, and I heard some um, uh, a gentleman that I had on my podcast as well, Daniel Benoit. He told me, I think he told me that I could be mistaken, or I read it somewhere. I believe Todd Standing's wife is a. Uh, She's involved in special effects or special. Effects well, that's a misconception. Oh, okay. She's a, she's a misconception. She's she is a cosmet a cosmetician, but okay. she doesn't work on Hollywood makeup. She makes people's faces up with eyeliner and rouge, and so she's a nothing to do with special effects makeup. Okay, yeah, and that's well, not. Did did he say his sister? Uh, say again. Sorry. Yeah. Did you say his sister or his wife? I think his wife. I, his I wife, could be, yeah. I could be, yeah, you, yeah what no, his wife. What saying is what but, I was told or what right, I read. I could right. just be uh, misquoting it. Or well, let, let me let me correct that. It's his ex-wife okay. now. He's okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um, yeah, he just, I watched a, a, a show that he was on. I can't remember what it was called, where Jeff Meldrum um, was involved with that as well, or he accompanied him out into. Yeah, to, with uh, Dr. Jim, John Bindernagel and uh, it was uh, Survivor Man Bigfoot with Les Stroud. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. And he seemed, uh, I don't know, he seemed very almost too over eager to prove that this thing exists because he's got a lot of footage where it's just him you know where he's putting the apples on the branches and stuff but again it's you know it's just 
Well, it's just him and the supposed Bigfoot. Um, sure. And they're so dangerous. Well, yeah, I, I wouldn't know. That's what he says. Oh, he was yeah. like screaming. It was like it was almost like the the footage that he's got is almost like Blair Witch Project type, right? You know, type of vibes that you get where he's like screaming at them and um, yeah, very- yeah. He well, think about it. You know, the uh, you know a person who barks the loudest at the carnival is known as the carnival barker, and that's what I think he was trying to do for their production. And I'm sure some of the production people were like, "Oh, this is great," and some of the other people were probably like. Ugh. But it's very interesting because there was a podcaster who went with Todd Standing on a Bigfoot mission, mm. and he had found a set in the back seat of what he thought were gorilla gloves or Bigfoot gloves. Oh, okay. And where did we see that? Oh, yeah, on his Amazon Prime documentary with the hand reaching in and grabbing the apple. The apple, yes. Yeah, so there's a lot of secrets. Well. There's a lot of secrets coming out that I know. That a lot of people don't know, and it's all coming from, you know. <laughs> well, and yeah, I mean, and again, you know, people are, people obviously ask the question of why go through all that effort. But I mean, if you can be, well, I'll tell you why because yeah. I I know at least one firefighter from Arizona, retired firefighter, who went on one of his expeditions and paid Todd three thousand dollars to go on this expedition. Okay, that's the reason why if he can pull off. 10 of those a year, you know, he's making 30 grand a year. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know, and he's charging between three grand and 3,500. And uh, yeah. And, and talking to this gentleman, uh, it was, um, well, I'm going to save that, you know, when I have him eventually on my podcast, but he wasn't very impressed. So that's why he reached out to me. Yeah. The firefighter. Yeah. 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 You know, he does a lot of what Todd was doing with the podcaster. Oh, look at this tree break. Look at that tree break. Look at that twist. Look at that bend. Look at that twist. Oh, oh. Whoa, whoa, whoa. yeah. Nothing. The tree break, the tree break thing um, was he went, he went on about that quite a lot, if I remember correctly, on that Survivor Man um, documentary. And um, I think Jeff Meldrum also said, well, it's, it, it, you know, he didn't really think much of it. Um, well, the other thing is, too, is people forget how Todd started in this business is uh, he started this website like mid 2004, beginning of 2005 called Sylvanic.com. OK, and it started like very Blair Witchy. And of course, Todd had owned a production company before that called Outstanding Productions. And um, he actually had posted in the uh, again, the, the newspaper, uh, the Edmonton Sun, and with his phone number on it, looking for actors and actresses. And yeah, that's a, that's a so this website starts, this website starts, Sylvanic is this mysterious place. You can only get into it by a small hole in this mountainside. And it only the, only the first America, or the, uh, what do they call it? The first American, they uh, know of this name. And it's an Indian name, Sylvanic. Well, number one, Sylvanic's a Latin name. And coincidentally, his mom's name is Sylvia. Uh, Not just saying, just saying. Yeah. So, and then he has these pictures of these three hikers that went missing. And I, it looks like a second grader wrote the, the, the sketch of the person. Well, why not have a real photo? Yeah. Why does it have to be a drawing of a person who went yeah. missing? Yeah. It made no sense. And then he was claim, making claims. He got all these hair samples and whatnot. And then apparently in one of the chats or something, I heard that he said, oh, well, his house gotten broken into. And they stole, they stole all those Bigfoot hair. You know, so, you know, we had this first video that came out and it was some woman on there. And people are trying to say this or that. Well, maybe it's just like, well, we really don't know because you only hear a voice. But the woman's like, you see all these like very ambiguous tracks in the snow. And she's like, hmm, what do we have here? Hmm? And then all of a sudden, off in the distance, you hear, oh, my God. And you oh, you see this tree shake and then the camera cuts out. And that was Sylvanic video number one. You know, so you look at this. Oh, that's the and, first video on the website. It was, yeah. Can you find it? It's very hard to find. I'll I do have it. a copy of it yeah. though. But um, but you know, it was very apparently what he was trying to do was trying to do 
with uh, Eduardo Sanchez did with the Blair Witch Project, which was very big at the time. And that was only a few years afterwards, was create this website, the whole myth of the Blair Witch, and then do it like this docu-series of missing people, mm -hmm. found footage and all this other stuff. And that's what this was all building up to be. And it made sense. Outstanding productions, looking for actors and actresses, everything fit into place. And um, in fact, it was kind of funny because Todd had this, um, he never listed himself as the director. Uh, he used another name, Todd something or other. And he actually had a, a Facebook page, which was that, that alias with his picture on it. So why would you hide the fact that you're, you know, really, really some bad stuff? Yeah. At some point you just so deep in it where it's kind of like, well, it, it's kind of like the whole, um, the whole, I can't stop body. now. Yeah. So deep in it. Now you got to, you know, do you, do you come clean or do you just, you know, what do you do? <laughs> well, then again, you got to look at some of these personalities. Um, you know, they, they have that, that narcissism itch, mm. you know, well, I'm never wrong. Yeah. I, I don't care what yeah. people think. Although I know God's attacked me using sock accounts. Oh, has he? Okay. Oh. Yeah, it's amazing all the, the people that come to his defense, but don't say anything logical. Mm. Like if I say, can you tell me where this is? You know, and that's how I always end up the, in the arguments with them a lot of times is I show them the very first one where, you know, it looked like the it looked like something like it was the felt face one with the button eyes and the, it looks yeah. like it's got a park on. Mm -hmm. People call it the Muppet. Um, You know, people say, you know, they won't ever attack or they won't ever, we should say, debate the validity. They'll just sit there and attack. Oh, you're just jealous, really. Yeah. Well, before you can tell me and before you can allow to say anything, answer this. I have one question for you. And then I post the Muppet. Are you telling me this is a Bigfoot? Mm. And guess what? None of them will answer that question. It's it's strange though, and that's that's I think that's that's a commonality in the whole paranormal field because I mean if you look at there are some people that will believe anything because right. I think I think you know from a psychological perspective it kind of fills this void of this stuff needs to be true because they are so emotionally invested, um, you know, in this stuff. I mean, if you if you look at the the um you know some of the ufo abduction incidents sure. um like betty and barney hill or travis walton or whatever now the 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 most evidence that they've got is um polygraph tests and in the case of betty and barney hill they've got well they were credible people and they they you know they confess these things under hypnosis now the the thing is, if you take that into a court of law and say, well, you know, they said it under hypnosis. Well, you can lie under hypnosis. It's it's a fact. You can. And your mind can make up things under hypnosis too. You can, you are actually more prone. You, yep. you the mind is actually more creative under yep. hypnosis. Sure. Um, and this is actually on the I don't know what the term is the American Hypnotherapy or whatever association. It's on their websites because it's frequently asked questions. Do you have to tell the truth under hypnosis? So, so that's the one part where people you know they can't be making it up. It was under hypnosis, and it's like, well, yes, they can. They can be making it up, and yeah, but they were credible people. You know, they worked for the post office and whatever the case may be. And it's like, well, because I do a lot of true crime stuff as well on my channel and you know a lot of the another passion of mine too is like yeah, true yeah. Facts. I love and a lot of the serial killers and stuff now again because i've had to defend myself from this because i did a segment about this i'm not comparing betty and barney hill to any serial killer what i'm just saying is uh let's and i always use this example dennis raider who was the btk serial killer he was a pretty people thought he was a pretty upstanding guy he, i think he was the president of his church you know he seemed like sure. a credible guy but you know it turns out he wasn't <laughs> so right, yeah. you know when, you can't you can't say well they me, were credible people so it has to be true let me uh, you know I, i'm actually writing my fourth book called uh, called the psychology of bigfoot okay and part of that is, is that hoaxing has the, the very same 
track of a crime. Because if you think about it, a crime is getting over on somebody, doing something that's morally wrong. Yeah. yeah. So it's the same with hoaxing. And believe it or not, some of the characteristics of serial hoaxers, serial hoaxers, are the same as other serial offenders. Yes. Right. They are narcissistic. They are prone to, so, uh, you know, sociopathy. They're yeah. prone to, you know, psychopathy. They're prone to these types of things. Um, you know, uh, look at Rick Dyer, who was who uh, turned around and made false allegations against, you know, people in the Bigfoot world mm. by taking articles about sexual offenders yeah. And changing it and altering it to put their name into it. You know, and that, I mean, without any regard, uh, without any empathy. Mm. And that's the biggest thing is there are a bunch of witnesses out there that, you know, this means a lot to. Yeah. And, okay, a joke, making a joke one time, okay, that's not a lack of empathy, but doing it time after time after time and and, and putting down people and, and making lies up about people and stuff like that. That just shows a total lack of empathy. They are narcissistic. Yeah. I'm the world's greatest Bigfoot hunter. Rick yeah. Dyer, right? Yeah. Again, there's that narcissism shining through. And what you find really under the skin of these people is a person that is flawed and a person that's had a probably a bad childhood. Um, who's had some trauma in their life psychologically. Mm. Um, but my job is I'm not a shrink, but I am a you know forensic interviewer. So, and that's a lot of psychology based stuff. And you know, I have probably interviewed well over two thousand criminals in my day. Yeah, asking them questions. Well, I mean, you know, and all these things, and and seeing how they lie, why they lie, what they do, what their background is, and actually being able, in some cases, to pierce that armor. Yeah. So I kind of have a, a very street level understanding of why people do what they do. Yeah, you kind of know which markers to look at. Um, yeah. 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 It's, and I mean, the thing is where you say people, people get aggressive, but if you ask them, yeah, but do they believe it, then they won't answer anything. It's, it's exactly the same. Like, uh, look, I'm not saying, uh, uh, you know, the same with Bob Lazar, the same with, uh, you know, uh, Betty and Barney, like I mentioned, Travis Walton. I'm not saying they're lying. I'm just not saying it's foolproof. Sure. That's what I'm saying. I'm, look, if they're telling the truth, I think it's awesome. You know, if well, it, you know, the, the interesting thing is, is that uh, there's a channel that, that actually I, I've taken a couple, few of their courses, the behavior panel mm. on how they read people and some of their micro expressions and stuff like that, which yeah. can lead. And they actually did one on Bob Lazar. Yeah. And um, they actually are like, wow, it looks like he's telling the truth. I've, 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 I think I've seen that. Yeah. And, and they were kind of stunned by that. They were expecting to have all these you know, expressions of showing. So it's who knows? I mean, I mean, some, some people, yeah. they they when, uh, you know, criminal profiling first became a thing, it was mm -hmm. very much knocked by a lot of people. And all oh, that's and some people are that way about this behavior and micro expressions, but it mm -hmm. works. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, people ask me. How do I, you know, one of the things I, I do is I, I, you know, not only a private investigator, but I also do a loss prevention job. So they're like, how do you know when people are going to steal? Like you automatically see them walk in and it's the the tension. Mm -hmm. I can see the tension on their face. And the minute I, and it took me a long time to, I could never say what, what it was until I started doing the behavior stuff. I go, now I know how it is because you see two people coming into a store. You should be like, oh yes, we're here we are shopping, blah, blah, blah. But they're yeah. like. And, and I mean, it's, it's, it's also with the credibility aspect. I mean, it's not like people walk around with, you know, the little board saying, well, you know, I'm credible. I'm credible. I mean, I'm, yeah. yeah, it's, 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 it's actually mind blowing how, um, you know, people will either believe a story or they won't believe it. There's very little, and I've, I've said this numerous times on the podcast before, there's very little middle ground where people are like, well, you know, I'm an open-minded skeptic, you know, they'll either believe or it's completely bullshit. Sure. It's, it's never kind of, you know, 
if it's true, maybe, yeah, cool. But because the only people that will really definitively know will be in these uh, circumstances will be <laughs> Bob Lazar, um, you know, the Travis Waltons and the Betty and Barney Hills. I mean, <laughs> You know, you know, it's amazing, though, is they're defenders. A lot of times the minions, they have minions who will defend them. Yeah. And they never put out. You know what the, the most typical YouTube comment is, is, oh, 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 you you don't believe in this person or, you're, you know, you've never been in the woods before. You know, well, you can sit back there and you've never been in the woods before. I don't even yeah. know who you are. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know you've only got 6,000 and he's got like 25,000 subscribers. It's like, yeah. you know, you know, I don't, I don't care what end of the political spectrum you're on, but look at this yeah. person's user account. Look at that person's user account. Mm. It's, it's about cult, the personality to get a user base, you know, and, and the whole thing is like, you've never been in the woods. Really? I've spent months out in the woods, yeah. Yeah. you know, um, but it's like that person knows you. Well, yeah, and then that person saying not them not knowing me is either trying to use every trigger word to get me mad. Yeah. (laughs) Which lends me to believe that may be a sock puppet to somebody too. Well, I wonder how much how much of these these comments are kind of like bots. Because I mean you hear of that as well. Um, you know, it's a lot of Oh no, they they, 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 a lot of these uh, are very specific. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Like they'll mention other people, and they'll they'll oh, be right, right. so. Yeah, I I'm always worried about the bots too. But yeah, um, you know, so it's funny, and I I tell people right on my YouTube channel, you know what? If you're not going to argue and, and debate in a in an adult fashion, you're just going to start name calling. You're gone. And I'm going to hide you from the channel. You're not going to be able to comment. I don't care. And, I haven't had I haven't had a lot of that, thankfully. Um. Oh, you may on this one, because I'm talking about, and we're, you know, the minions I call, uh, you know, I, I, we have the standlings, which mm-hmm. is the minions of Todd. Um, there's the, uh, you know, biscottis, which are the biscottis and you have the, uh, the, the diorites. And, uh, I don't want to even get into Zorth. Yeah. I haven't, I'm going to be honest with you. I haven't, uh, uh, out of all those names that you just mentioned, the only guy I've heard of is Todd standing. So, oh, geez, yeah. I mean, you know, makes... yeah. Cause Biscardi has been, he's been kind of low level since about 2008. He try if that was really his big knock, he had a, he had an event in 2006, which he got knocked for in or 2005. And then here he is trying to pull another stunt in 2008. And that was that people had enough of him. But Dyer, for whatever reason, he did that in 2008. Five years later, he comes back or four years later, comes back in 2012, 2013 with another body hoax, takes one on safari around the country. Mm. Um, you know, and it, it was quite comical, to tell you the truth. But, um, you know, now it's like he keeps saying stuff and he's not getting any traction. It's every few years, the paradigm shifts in this thing. So, this, you know, so there are people that probably truly don't know who I am, you know, because they haven't caught up with the last 20 years of research. Yeah. Well, I mean, if 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 those same people can actually take the time um, to post a negative comment on something, which is very, you know, it is a bit of a double edged sword. Um in you know, in whichever case, whether it be Bigfoot, UFOs, or or whatever sure. it is, you obviously don't have you know much time in your hands, or or you've got too much, you've got too much time in your hands. I've I haven't posted a lot of, I haven't commented on a lot of stuff ever. I just, yeah, I just don't. Well, it, it's very interesting that I, I put a video up. Uh, there's one called the Mississippi Skunk Ape video. Yeah. And I started looking into that whole thing. And, and there was a the gentleman who filmed it, uh, you know, and th- these were my thoughts as I'm writing out the investigation. Well, he, there's no story really behind it that we can see of, you know, two, there's no before and after footage. Three, he starts filming and then he claims he got scared and runs away when it stood up. He should have been scared to begin with. So I do a Google search and I find out that the only place I can find this guy's name besides his Facebook page and his YouTube channel is in the IMDB and not Uh, as an actor, but not as an actor, as a character that an actor is playing. So I go to that show 
and it was a four episode like a pilot run of like a southern version of mountain monsters <laughs> and that's where the video was shown right and that you know so there, there's a way we, we and you know it's fake because you know an actor is playing him by the imdb but yeah, yeah josh, josh doesn't want josh hightower that's the guy thing oh he doesn't want to be seen so we blurred his face out He's an actor. It's not even the real guy. Why would you blur his face out? This is all fake. It's full sensation. Right. Yeah. So when you post all this information out, show the IMDB stuff and Josh, Josh Highcliffe or whatever, Josh Highcliffe, I think his name was. Mm. Anyway, you, you put all this information out there. And then the trolls come along and go, Oh, you, you know, I don't find where there's any evidence of him, you know, being scared and running away. You know, why well, he, he may have been, they take the weakest argument, but forget the strongest argument well it's it it is yeah and um it because it doesn't suit their narrative right exactly so, so basically with and again this is the last yep. time i'm going to touch on this betty and barney hill thing where because i made the comment as well about the whole dennis raider being credible at one stage and he ended up being a serial killer i specifically even said in the segment that i did i'm not comparing betty and barney hill to a serial killer I, I, I literally said that. And then some guy will post. It didn't matter. I, some guy will post, I can't believe you just compared them to serial killers. I'm like, fuck, you know. You know, it's uh, I don't yeah. I don't really take those. I don't, I don't take it seriously. Yeah. I, 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 I basically post and ghost. That's. Yeah, I, I kind of laugh. You know, I, I laugh, especially when they go, oh, yeah. look how many subscribers. They all oh, one of those, you know. Uh, yeah, it's. It's like, uh, well, I don't know. It's. um. Well, OK, back to Bigfoot. Why, yeah, let's get back. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you think a body has ever been found? Because I know that is a general thing where people are kind of also quick to dismiss the whole thing because, you know, no body, no evidence. So uh, I would ask a question, how many bodies are found of known animals in the woods? Not many, unless they've been killed by a human and left as, mm. you know, in a heap. And it's rather fresh. Yeah. Um. You know, you may find a deer car carcass or three or four in, in your runs in the woods, maybe even a couple of dozen, but there are millions of deers and deer in the United States. Yeah. yeah. Um, nature has a great, and this is why we know, you know, people say, oh, well, I think they buried their dead. That's the reason why. If they buried their dead, we'd be finding them because we bury the dead to protect the body from scavengers. That's why we bury our dead. Yeah. So what it is, is when a body drops, nature takes over i mean they had the the deer carcass on the on the uh the body farm in tennessee and that disappeared in 14 days completely bones and all mm. there are many animals that will eat bone that need bone if they have a calcium deficiency their body tells them that includes coyotes raccoons um uh, yeah possums yeah. uh hogs bear they'll eat you know barrel chomp through bones too mm. so you know, there's a lot of things that'll that'll just munch through that. Then you have insects and parasitic and you know parasites and stuff, and they're all it's gone. It doesn't take much long. It doesn't take long. Mm. Bigfoot and infrasound is that a possibility? Could they be communicating by absolutely, by absolutely? And I think that is a good explanation for some of the folks that have had some of the more quote unquote paranormal, yeah. Um, Ad, you know adaptations oh it told me to get out of there no that's what you're just your mind is your ears are vibrating your eyes are vibrating so all of a sudden it may turn into an orb because of infrasound that's you're hallucinating that but you don't know that it looks as real as anything to you um where the bigfoot just disappeared not only do you have that infrasound but you may have uh you know what they call traumatic regression whereas your body your mind is so Panicked at seeing this, you forget it. Mm. And then all of a sudden the Bigfoot's gone. Where'd it go? Yeah. Well, it's been there the whole time, but you were just in so much fright and trauma that it disappears. But infrasound is a real thing. I've been out there in the woods where I've where I'm out there, you know, all the time. And it'd be like all of a sudden, and this, this is like I can count the number of this this happening maybe on one hand mm. of all the times I've been out there, all of a sudden saying. I'm being okay. watched, you know, neck stand, you know, hair standing up my neck, feeling nauseous, feeling really creeped out, mm. feeling um, threatened almost like, I think I better get out of here. 
Um, it's only happened a few times, um, but it does happen. I can't explain it why, you know, and I'm not in, in the areas I'm talking about are not earthquake prone, which, you know, the earth will throw out infrasound before an earthquake, which is the reason why they, they think some of the animals may have a reaction to that and getting out of, out of Dodge. Cause they can sense that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's very, I mean, that uh, that's almost a game changer then for or also more of an explanation as to why people just don't see them or, you know. Yeah. Well, um, you know, interesting, when I wrote my my second book, What Would Sasquatch Do? I, I, want, I talked about infrasound. And one of the things I discovered was that uh, every animal family has um, literally um, the, the largest of their family has the ability to use infrasound, the biggest cat the biggest whale, the elephant, which is the biggest of their family group, can use it. Tigers, you know. Um, so I found that quite, quite fascinating that it was always the biggest. And you know what? All those animals are mammals. And yeah. primates are mammals, too. So if Sasquatch being the biggest of the primates would make sense, why it may have the ability to use infrasound. And um, do you think there's a connection between... Um... You familiar with missing four one one? I think it's a. I think David Polides. Yes. Is the, yeah. yeah. Um, do you think there's a connection there? Um, and all but a maybe one or two instances, mm -hmm. uh, I would think. And the reason why is is that, uh, and and one of the things I did before, one of the first things I I got into this about two thousand eight, I started looking at primate behavior. Yeah. And you know, primate. Uh, you know, Bigfoot's obviously a primate articulate hands and feet, large brain, small snout, forward eyes for, for, for accurate vision. Um, primates of one species rarely attack primates of other species. Um, you know, there was a study of macaques back in the seventies where this one type of macaque, different species, mind you, went, went by into a territory of another macaques and they acted just like a Sasquatch would, they got mad. They were throwing things. They were jumping up and down. They were screaming. Mm -hmm. They were posturing. And, but they let that other species pass through their territory. Yeah. If it was the same species, there would be an all out war. There'd be a fight. <laughs> and of course, there are, and it even said there are some cultural differences, like some groups of chimpanzees will attack monkeys and eat them. Mm. But it's true too. There are some humans that will eat monkeys as well, but for the most part, we always think, "Ugh, I don't want that." Well, well, anything, anything pressed into a corner, and I mean, think about it. You know, uh, you know, if if you got if you saw a thread of a monkey or even a capuchin or whatever, you know, what are you going to do? You wouldn't have a second thought about killing it or hurting it if it's going to hurt your family or if it's got you backed in a corner. Yeah. So oh, that's yeah. always the, the 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 risk factor there. Mm. I think they're very adaptive. I think they they see hunters, they hear the gun, that means the dinner bells ring and they're not afraid of guns because nobody anybody rarely shoots at them. Mm. So they, you know, they hear the gun and they gun now they start looking around for the deer that drop or the bird that drop like and that's why a lot of hunters go, I don't know. I when I know I got them real good and I went out there and it was gone. You know, look like it was carried off. So they're, you know, they they learn, and that's you know that's a primate thing. They're learned. They're curious. So people that want to go skulking around in the woods, uh, you're only going to draw their suspicion up. You know, you yeah. you know, my group always walks loud and proud because guess what? Those noises will be like, ooh, entertainment. Because primates need to be entertained. We just can't idly sit. Yeah. Do you think? And uh, this is going into kind of almost semi conspiracy territory now, but do you think governments are covering up certain things or gov well, governments or um, let's say national parks where, because obviously like, let's say like you said, you know, the Yosemite, a fair number of people have gone missing, but it's not like they're going to announce that, uh, you know, there's a wild, you know, there's a wild animal on the loose or possibly Sasquatch, Bigfoot, whatever, because it would, I mean, they, they would lose a, uh, you know, a shitload of money. Could well, I think? I, yeah. I think in terms of cover up, there's not like this big national conspiracy. 
Okay. I, I don't think there's anything up from the top, you know, because you you know what? It would have come out by now that there was this memo. Hey, we need to do this. We need to do that mm-hmm. because the memos have come out in something that does affect national security. And that's the, the UAP slash UFO stuff. Right. Yeah. So Sasquatch does not affect national security. So mm-hmm. the, the whole thing is it's probably an unspoken word that we just kind of smile. And just choose to ignore it or choose yeah, to think, say it doesn't yeah. exist. You know, okay, in case you find some tracks, rake them out. Mm-hmm. Nothing like, oh, we need to uh, grab that body and have the special military flight come in, pick yeah. the body up. There was this big, huge story about, uh, you know, the Mount St. Helens eruption. And, oh, the National Guard came in and the Army came in and rescued all these, you know, they took all the Bigfoot bodies out. Mm-hmm. And I talked to a National Guardsman who was there. He's like, we didn't have time to even think about animals. He goes, our our search and rescues were for people. He goes, the place got hit by virtually a 25 megaton bomb. We're not going to have time to worry about hiding a Bigfoot. But now you're going to have you're going to have people saying, but that's what he was told to say. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and guess what? The guy is a Bigfoot believer. He's wow. had his own encounter. And yeah. he goes, you know, I believe him. You know, you can tell I believe him. But, you know, nobody can ever cite me a, an accurate source on that at all, saying, oh, well, this guy said that he did this or this guy said they did this, mm. you know. Yeah, it's uh, there was there was also a video that um, was uh, it was about a bunch of guys. They were. I, th- I don't know if they were standing around a campfire or they were barbecuing. And then in the background, there was, it almost looked like a monkey that was swimming for, swinging from branch to branch. Um, and uh, there was a thing that that was Bigfoot as well. How big was it? Well, it was kind of like in the distance. I mean, I had to check. Well, I, I look at it this way. Um in 2003, I was given a film that was filmed accidentally in 1997 that shows a very large, upright thing in the background yes. at the far side of this music festival. And as it walks, something jumps off its back. That's the one. That's the one. Yeah. And then it swings. Yeah. And if you think about it, I, you know, I don't know how big it is, but you don't see any tail. Um, I was the first to investigate that. I was the first one to see that film in the Bigfoot community. That's the one I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah, And that's why I believe it's a young one. Because if you think about it, number one, it jumped off the back. You can tell there's a bigger one and there's a bigger shadow in the background. Mm. Um, If you think about it, all primates, when they are young, love to climb. That's why we have monkey bars for us. Yeah. Because it's time. It's a developmental time. We're exploring the use of our hands and our feet and we're climbing things and we're swinging things and we're, we're doing that. Baby gorillas do that. Baby chimps do that. You know, we do it. And uh, when that point was brought up to that person, they said, why do you think, well, that was a good point, you know, and then that's it. It's just a developmental stage. So yeah, they like to climb. Um, The alternative theory is that somebody's monkey that or a pet primate that got let into this area that number one didn't allow those kind of animals and didn't allow any animals in there mm. to a state where it's illegal to own a primate okay. and to have such a well-behaved primate, then you're going to just let it go up into a tree and do its thing and then come back and be unnoticed by everybody around you. You know, and it just, uh, what makes more sense <laughs> You know, the Bigfoot actually makes more, a young Sasquatch actually makes more sense in this argument because there were no escapes. And even if it was an escape, how do you explain it coming off the big one's back? You know? Um, yeah, it's in, in, in what area was this again? It was in Modena, New York, in a, in a rural section of, um, I believe, Ulster County, I believe. And were um, they, have they been Bigfoot sightings in that area? Uh, across the Hudson, there have been numbers. Uh, a little bit to the south in Orange County, there's been dozens. Okay. Um, it's very, you know, it's not too far from the beginning of the Alleghenies. 
Mm. So, you know, you have a lot of very interesting things. And the other interesting thing is uh, when I got the film, I ended up not getting there for 12 years because that area had been an AT. It turned, by the time I got it, the, the, the whole campsite was gone. Now it was an ATV park. So I'm like, uh. and then it switched hands a couple of times. And then finally Bigfoot wanted to do a show on it. Mm-hmm. Since I was the lead investigator, they contacted me to get a hold of the, the witness and whatever. And they said, would you like to go out there? I would love to. So we, I went out with the producers and we walked the area and I was like, wow, and we, I think we got the right tree. I took some pictures, but the one thing I was amazed is behind that tree that I always knew it was an apple orchard, an old apple orchard. Yeah. So there's some food source, but not only that, but when I searched that whole area, it was an entire fruit farm. Okay. <laughs> there was stra- wild strawberries still growing, raspberries, blueberries, blackberries all over the place. Um, so I was like, now I understand why something would come down here and just, it's the festivals, all the people are across the river, you know, across the lake. Man, let's go over here, eat what we want and go. Made all sense in the world. Yeah, it's, uh, well, obviously they, they will be people that that would say, well, they'll go with the escaped monkey theory before they go with Bigfoot. Um, but they still can't explain that tall person. That's all dark in the background. Couldn't it just have been a person? I'm the, you know, look, I've, I've, I mean, yeah. I don't know. Um, <laughs> it could be, but the people that were at that particular tent had gone into the, the festival because they had actually asked our photographers to keep an eye on their place. I think what a lot of people and, are, are kind of getting at is that the, the chances of it, it you know, if they were going to bet the house on, on whether it's Bigfoot or, Maybe an escaped monkey, you know, as crazy as that. Well, I mean, it. it... Well, the whole thing is, is that we checked for that and that did not happen. So I'd be like, well, go ahead, show me where there was an escaped monkey during that time period. And we'll change our idea on it. Mm. But nobody's been able to. So, yeah, you know, that that's the amazing thing about it. It's very interesting. And uh, is it a Bigfoot or not? I don't know. Uh, I, you don't really know because it's you know worst yeah, time of day, but yeah, it's yeah. it's very compelling. And at least we're looking at something that hey, for once it's not somebody in a freaking suit. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and this is something that's gone on here that's out of the ordinary, and we can all agree upon that. What happened was it was captured on a VHSC tape. Mm. It got copied once, and it got uh, or it got copied to a VHS. Be- because the VHS, the first, yeah. The VHS right. came to me, and then I had to professionally turn to DVD. Yeah. And back in 2003. So, it, you know, that was something you couldn't do on the computer. Any, uh, yeah. You had to take to a professional. Mm. And my God, that copy is so good. If you look at that, you're like, people think you, you're looking at it almost 4K. And you're like, you can yeah, see it I mean, pop. The, the the time of day is probably the worst time of day. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's literally black and gray. Those are the two. Yeah, it's dusk. Yeah, it's, 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 so it's twilight, so I should say. Yeah. yeah, it's twilight. Yeah. yeah, it's like son of a. Why couldn't yeah. it have been that? Like, why? Ah. Yeah, and then when you spot it, then you're like, okay, okay, finally. Uh, you try and kind of deduce what it could be, but um, it's uh, yeah, uh, you know. And what is next? What else have you got going on? What's next for you? And yeah, well, we're into the winter months now, so so unless something pops somewhere um it's pretty much okay now we got till spring and we're gonna reformulate what we're gonna do for the spring next year um uh, you know a lot of this time of year a lot of people you know you know they're conference people like oh give me the conferences so that gets it up i always try to do my writing and um so i'm you know i'm in the process of, of writing my fourth book psychology of bigfoot hopefully that'll be out by the springtime i'm not rushing this along okay. it's a very well researched book um i and uh, we're developing some you know we're always looking at developing some technology that we can bring out there sharpening you know sharpening our behavior skills on but and you know keeping an eye on what's going on around the community um and uh, keep running the podcast. And, you know, that kind of keeps me uh, motivated to keep on keeping on. So. Yeah, you've got a successful podcast, The Squatch Detective um, on yep. on YouTube. Yep, Squatch DTV. Yep. Yes. 
And, um, you know, in terms of technology, how much could drone technology that could go for hours upon hours, um, because obviously the drone technology out there now can't really go for long periods of time. How much could that help? Uh, It depends on what locations. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, um, Obviously, you're going to want areas that have open fields, you know, surrounded by some some pretty because you know if something gets under that canopy nobody's going to find it um and you, you got to remember that that the federal government took them like a few years to find eric robert rudolph centennial mm-hmm. park bomber mm-hmm. uh because he went up in the mountains and they had helicopters with the highest technology of of you know thermal they could and they just couldn't penetrate that canopy mm-hmm. so you know it's going to take uh a little bit of luck. I think it's possible. But then again, if you're looking at a thermal on a drone, it's still not going to prove anything. You know, it, uh, the, you know, a FLIR image is great. It's a great field tool. I think you yeah. hear something, you pull it up. Okay. That is a mouse. That is a deer. That that's a Sasquatch, but okay. What are you going to do with that? You're going to put it up there and say, Hey, look, we got a Sasquatch. People are going to argue with you. Well, yeah, I mean that, that's that's right? that's going to. So you think science is going to accept that as the real deal? Mm-hmm. So what we need to do is use that as a tool to find out where they are, to lay some very invasive, in non-invasive DNA traps. Do you think it could be a case where it's kind of like? Um researchers are running out of time because Bigfoot could be going, possibly be going extinct. I don't think so. Um, reason why is uh, sightings have only increased. You know, think yeah. about it. You know, uh, people are coming out of the woods a little bit more. People are going into the woods a lot more since COVID. Yeah. <laughs> Which can may explain the hike or the spike in, in sightings. Because now there's more pe- more eyes out in the woods and more like, oh, you know. Um, the effect I think it's had on them is, is they've gone even further remote. Like some of my areas that were very active pre-COVID yeah. are like really quiet now. Mm. Um, and it's going to take a few years before they decide to wander back and let the woods quiet out a bit. And I think after this year, you're going to start seeing that that going to the woods decline a little bit. Because now people, and then that traditionally happens in a bad economy. So you're going to kind of see that people of state tend to stay home a little bit more. So you may see the return after after maybe this season um, to, you know, uh, that. And I think that's just a natural reaction. Oh, it's, it's crowded over here. A lot of people, I'm, we need to move on. Yeah. And that's the quickest way to, to scare a, a Sasquatch group out of the area is, is infested with people for a long time. You know, a few here and there ain't going to do it. But when you have like hundreds of people a day visiting the same area or even 50 or 60 going up the same trail, that's going to cause problems. Should they be considered dangerous? I mean, is there a way of knowing? I don't think so. I think if uh, we were finding, you know, bodies everywhere, um, you know, even if you, you, you took and said, let's. Let's uh, take every single missing 411 person and and lump them into a Bigfoot category. That's still a very minuscule amount of people compared to the number of people that are out in the wild, Mm -hmm. you know, going out and visiting and recreating there and doing all that stuff. I think it's still, and I think that number is very small. Maybe, I think maybe in the history of man, maybe we have maybe 20. Let's just say throw out a wild number of 20. And the reason I'm basing that, let's say the Bauman account that that Theodore Roosevelt wrote about, you know, uh, you know, the Bauman account. Let's say that was real. Well, there's one death. Where's the other documented ones? You don't see too many. Well, I guess the 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 final question that I've pretty much got, Santa, you know, if you're if you were in a situation where you physically saw bigfoot you've got evidence you've got you know you've got all this stuff would you pretty much disclose it to the public knowing that there could be a risk of you know big time game hunters now putting all their sights and focus on bigfoot for the for the aim of of shooting it well well, the whole idea is is to be very conservative about where your locations are 
That's uh, just me as a, I treat every uh, a witness comes to me, says, Hey, I've had, I treat that like a crime scene. Like we yeah. can't disclose where it is. We, uh, I, sometimes I don't even like disclosing the County. I had, uh, I had some pictures I reviewed last week and the, the woman just wanted, she goes, I oh, know I want you to say the County because I want people in case they've seen something to report it. Mm. I'm like, okay, I'll do it because you requested it. But yeah. normally I would just give it to the state, north, south, east, west. Mm. Um, but um, the whole idea is to keep your your sighting area like a crime scene. And the only people you're going to tell is people you're going to bring in. And those are usually other researchers. Yeah. You know, and, uh, and you know, maybe maybe I want to have, uh, you know, Alex Petikoff come down, and you know, a friend of mine or, or you know, even um, – Cliff Barrickman or somebody say, hey, Cliff, you know, you want to come down and check it out when you're in area? Yeah, sure. And I'll take them to an area. You know, that that's okay. I mean, because yeah. they understand. Um, but yeah, you don't want to disclose, hey, yeah, right here is where yeah, we had exactly. Bigfoot sighting. And then yeah. and that's kind of what happened to my first area as well. Um, because not because of me, but between videos on, you know, between Monster Quest and a couple other special people, you know, some people, especially the locals, kind of figured out where it was. Oh. So and that kind of salts the area a little bit. And it came out to be that I did find a fake track, I think, in 2013, 2014, somewhere in there. So I'm like, well, I'm out of there till 2017. Mm. And uh, that's pretty much why I stayed out of there. I mean, that's a salted area now. I got to stay yep. away from it and let, let it rest royal. You know, there's no fun for hoaxers if there's no Bigfoot research. So, yeah. No, well, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, well, I mean, uh, it's 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 such a fun subject to actually delve into. I mean, um, Jane Goodall believed in Bigfoot. And, you know, I've had stories from people who you have to believe them. So there's something I don't know what it is. Uh, she said she, she you know, she there there's evidence that tends to, to that. And it would be a wonderful thing if it existed. I don't yeah. shoot it down, you know, offhand because there's been a lot of primates that are found. So. Yeah, no, exactly, exactly. It's one of the great mysteries of the world. And um, yeah, Steve, thank you very much. Oh, anytime. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you very much for your time. And um, yeah, looking forward to your book. Ah, I'll let you know. Awesome, and thanks for having me on. It's a great time. Thank you very much.